assembling and be ready to go at uh, 3 o'clock. We're just about on time. And thank you to another wonderful panel of experts who have taken the time to be here with us today to share your information expertise to make sure that not only our children are safe, but adults on the internet as well. So thank you for that. Let me introduce this panel. They are here to speak about the dangers of disclosing too much information publicly. How do criminals use the internet? How do stalkers and financial scam artists use the internet? How are bullies using the internet? And what are the latest trends? We will be hearing this afternoon from Sergeant Rolando Bracamontes, who is with the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department. And he's part of the Southern California High Tech Crimes and Internet, uh, he looks at Southern California High Tech Crimes and Internet Privacy Crimes. Sergeant Richard Ruiz with the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department Special Victims Unit. Detective Jose Veramontes with the Los Angeles Police Department and Jonathan Fairlow with the Los Angeles District Attorney's Office. He is the Assistant Head Deputy of High Tech, the High Tech Tr Crime Division. Thank you very much for being here, and I will begin with a few questions, and please feel free to jump in, whoever is interested in answering. So why don't we just start with, what are the dangers of disclosing too much information online in places like Facebook or Twitter or any of the other possibilities? Well, I'd, I'd like to start, I'd like to open by saying that a lot of the times, some of the dangers are unknown to the victim when they first post the information. And it would, when it's first posted, it's not until that affects them that they realize, gosh, I shouldn't have done that. So number one, education is important. Uh, some of the dangers that uh, we're seeing is people put, put more than uh, normal personal information. Uh, first and last name, town where they live, and friends' names along with family members' names. If you go to websites like Zabasearch, Veromi, Pipple.com, and many, many other websites that are people locators, you will find that if somebody has an obsession or fixation with you, it's so easy to find not only you, your brothers, your fathers, family members, relatives, and so on and so forth. So. Your anonymity, your, your, your privacy is completely gone. And it's not until they have that person who has that fixation, that abnormal fixation, that they become aware, gosh, maybe I shouldn't have posted my sister's address, and maybe I shouldn't have posted that we're having a party at her house, because now the weirdo is uh, at the front door hiding in the bushes, and that's when the police department's called, and we get to act on that. As we all know, the social networking sites are now the new meeting grounds for adults. Unfortunately, uh, they're the meeting grounds for children. Uh, a lot of these kids are very comfortable getting on the internet and pretty much giving out a lot of information about themselves, uh, putting pictures out there. A lot of these kids are spending a lot of time on that internet, uh, Facebook, MySpace, and not thinking about who's watching, uh, literally the world. Uh, yeah, Sheriff Baca pointed out a little bit of uh, statistics that uh, we recorded last year, 6,000 um, uh, identity theft reports that were reported to the Sheriff's Department that was uh, last year. Prior to that, I think it was 7,000, so we've seen a little bit of a decrease. Nevertheless, um, identity theft is the number two cybercrime in the United States. And, and one of the things that as an identity theft, what I would do um, is go to these social networking sites and, and look to see what I can find out, if I can, if I can cultivate some victims um, you know, from, from the social networking sites. And you'd be surprised using the resources that my colleague uh, just outlined uh, along with some of the social networking sites, um, even, even paying a little bit of money um, ten dollars, you know, for some um, um, uh, open source information. You'd be surprised at, at what you can come up with, and so it is critical um, to um, to understand the consequences um, with with putting too much information out there about not only yourself but of your family as well, and not just in your application or on your on your uh, what they call on your wall, but but even in your in, in the content of your discussions with your friends. 
uh, I think that's also critical. Do not disclose as much information. Just because you're speaking to your friend um, in an open forum, you have to understand that <laughs> you may not know who else is watching and listening to what it is that you're, well, typing, that is. Mm -hmm. I have a question kind of generally. Uh, does anyone here carry cash anymore beyond the odd <laughs> maybe 20 or $40? <laughs> so uh, what do our criminals focus on? things of value to steal or to leverage. And quite frankly, we don't keep cash anymore. What we keep and what we value is information. And information and the act of profiling it, of gathering it, has become the new holy grail of the criminal element. Information has value in multiple different ways. I can use it to obtain credit, which are all things that we're pretty comfortable with. We all know the general types of ID theft. But I can also use it to blackmail you. I can also use it to target your business. And perhaps most importantly, I can use it to gain an advantage in regular day-to-day -day activities. Something as simple as identifying a individual at a company that we're engaged in a negotiation with, targeting that individual on Facebook, gathering information about them, and then using oh, information about their high school class to contact them as an old classmate and to do a SQL injection onto the site to gain access to the email servers and other information for the victim company to know the discussions going on in the negotiations. There are a myriad of ways that information can have value. And anytime information is presented open, unprotected, and available for all, it can be profiled, collected, and used against. So why don't we talk for a little bit about what sorts of bits of information should people be especially careful about not sharing on the internet. One thing that I have um, been amazed at is observing individuals who might uh, be at the shopping mall or uh, the baseball game and there's a table where you can sign up for something for free, whatever it is, you know, like a travel bag or whatever. And the person with that little postcard that you're going to fill out is asking for some information that is likely not in your best interest to put on the internet so it can be aggregated. But why don't we talk about that for a moment. What types of specific information do you think are particularly, people should be very careful about not putting in places where they, it might be shared? Uh, I'd like to address that for a bit. Uh, how many of you guys know anybody who's ever won that car that's sitting in the middle of the mall when you fill out that application? Has anybody ever met anybody who's officially beat you? No, I haven't. One? One, one. Everybody else in this, on this internet forum viewing this, I, I think we have one, all right? Uh, it, it's important to understand how these companies or how these resources obtain our information. Sometimes is inadvertently. How many of you guys go out and fill out that discount, that Ralph's discount card or CVS discount card, right? We disclose information. We don't know that they turn around to a marketing company and resell your information over and over and over again. Providing bigger collect information collection uh, internet companies to collect that information and store it in a database, where now as a consumer you can go and buy that information. That's how we inadvertently give our information out. They have our home address, our age, how much we make a year, our closest relative, husbands, whatever, 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 and uh, most specifically, our email address, where they start to target you sometimes with, with the advertisements. But anybody paying a small fee can obtain that information, and we just inadvertently gave the whole world basic information that identifies us. And here's another problem that we have when we talk about stalking. Sometimes at the threat management unit, we deal with celebrity stalkers. We dealt with a case where a celebrity, Sean Johnson, she's a gymnast, the guy came over from Florida to stalk her. And during the trial, during the actual trial, this guy had Googled her. Uh, he literally, uh, or she literally posted on, while well, this case, is the, the trial's going on, she posted, love going to Theodore's, my favorite shopping store, my agent and my mom took me there this afternoon. Well, society's learning from that. Kids are posting that information real time. Little do they know that Sean Johnson, the celebrity, wasn't really at Theodore's. 
She's being paid by these companies, companies to post that information. But it's a trend, it's a catch. So now we have you, juveniles, people as the general public posting, oh, I just had coffee at Denny's. Or I just had, you know, a great, they do that inadvertently. Little do they know that these big name people and celebrities are actually being paid hundreds and thousands of dollars to do this. I do a lot of internet safety presentations to uh, PTA groups, uh, to kids, and the number one thing I tell the kids and the parents is basically pictures, pictures, pictures. Everything they post on that internet site that they're in is gonna be looked at by the world. Uh, if there's a sexual predator out there uh, uh, looking around and he sees a child in front of a school and the child puts down there that they're 10, 12 years old, if this person wants to target that child, they're gonna find them. If that child's name is Jasmine and they're in front of Washington Elementary School, they will find that child. So one of the things I tell a lot of the parents and the kids is watch what you post on the internet, especially pictures. Any other thoughts on that? Some of our best investigative resources, investigative tours are found on the internet. Um, utilizing some of the same resources that these criminals are using are some of the resources that we use as well. And um, unfortunately, he's right. Um, the more information you post out there, uh, the more available it is to not only to the good people, but to the bad people. Um, unfortunately, once you hit send, once you publish that information, there is no recall button. There is no way to, to get it back. Now, on top of that, you have absolutely no control over what is done with it thereafter. Um, whether it goes to a marketing company, whether it goes to you know, the East Coast, you have absolutely no control. And it's critical. It's critical to know that before you actually post something, know what, know what the ramifications are going to be and know that uh, you have no control over that information anymore. The area that, that I like to talk to uh, people about with internet safety is, uh, I don't believe it is possible to not provide in information or to hide yourself effectively anymore. I, I know of very few people who have managed it, and the work and effort it re requires is almost a akin to being a Luddite. So what I focus on is, what is your unique information? If your name is James Smith, I'm not so much worried about your name, uh, nor am I worried about your email address, jamesmith23 at yahoo.com. However, if you have a unique last name, if you have a phone number that is not listed, if you've got information that is personal to you and is relatively unique, that is easy to find in an internet search, that's the information you need to watch more closely because that, are, that is the piece of data that can help find you among the herd of other people whose data is out there. I um, have a question with regard to um how police reports might be written in the event that you're investigating a case that has some connection or link to the internet. When I was working on the legislation with Sheriff Baca, what I found was, although I had lots and lots of stories and had heard about many serious cases, it was very hard to do um, actual data searches to find these actual uh, situations, these incidents. Um, is there, are police reports, have, have they caught up, excuse me, caught up with the technology in a way that um, there is some reference that the internet is involved in a particular case that you're investigating so that it is possible to aggregate information about what sort of crimes are um, happening that have some, you know, reference or help with, you know, the internet is somehow connected in, in, the, in the element of that crime? Well, um I think that you're going to find that each agency has its own police report. However, since most agencies are going to do reporting to the FBI, the standards set by the FBI tend to become the de facto segregation data silos, so to speak, to help identify police report information. So if you are looking for a method to get more discrete data about different types of crime. It is the reporting standards set up by the FBI for national databases that I think are going to be the most effective method for standardization. Otherwise, it's really up to each department based upon how it wishes to evaluate the, the criteria. The other factor is you could look at crime types, but I don't think that's particularly effective because of the fact that I can use the internet to commit or be involved with or support almost any type of crime. And merely looking at identity thefts or computer intrusions or 528.5s is only going to give you a narrow slice. And 
That's, that's what I found in my research. So you as practitioners, do you have any suggestions on how one would be able to uh, maybe change reporting practices that would allow people to uh, see what sort of trends we have in certain types of crimes um, that are impacted by the internet? Obviously, we all know that uh, identity theft is, is a big one. The internet's often used for that, but it's not always uh, easy to go back and you might find an identity theft case, but it might not have that hook of uh, the internet was used to do this, that, and that in this case. Do you have any thoughts on that? In the Sheriff's Department, we have what is known as statistical codes. Uh, the unfortunate thing is a lot of these crimes are multiple. A lot of times we might have a crime involving a child at the same time, we'll have a crime involving hacking. Uh, and within our own department, uh, Special Victims Bureau handles the, the crimes against children. If there's a hacking case, I'll pass it over to Rolando and his group will handle the hacking part of it. So yes, uh, is it evolving? Yes, it is. Uh, we're constantly changing our stat codes uh, to, to meet the current demand of what's going on within the internet. This very sub uh, subject is actually something we've been discussing over the past week and we are in the process of uh, uh, evolving and changing policy um, and uh, establishing some sort of method to be able to capture more than just you know the identity theft statute but maybe some of the more intricacies that are involved in the particular cases were more uh, um, uh, of the types of uh, cyber crimes that are involved with with any one particular you know identity theft or as, as uh, my colleague said, a 528.5 uh, false impersonation of another using the internet. Uh, I think you're, I think a better data source for you <coughs> might be the actual internet service providers themselves with the number of subpoenas that they respond to. Or, or uh, because I think that going to each and every D, D department or even trying to set up a code method uh, runs into several practical problems. The first is, is that uh, again in a police report that's becoming more and more checkbox focused with a lot of different in information, it's easy for a, a checkbox to, to be left off. And if it doesn't have a direct correlation either with the assignment of the case or a charging structure, it's a work that might not necessarily get focused or, or done. The second issue is now that it's becoming so common for internet information to be available, many of the requests are made just at the station detective level to gather information. So absent some way to collate or collect the information being gathered at each department, uh, I think that's a very difficult task to, to try and get from the departments themselves. Um, obviously, this, uh, the types of crimes have been evolving over time with the internet too. So. How, how have these crimes, how have internet crimes changed, say, maybe over the last five years? What are the trends we're seeing? Um, and any thoughts on growth in certain types of crimes as a result of the internet? What sort of crimes are most prevalent using well, the internet? Well, uh, I've been uh, prosecuting these cases for about 11 years. And when I started, uh, ID theft was the big thing, and most of it was good old-fashioned uh, stuffing and jogging, people going along and stealing your mail and filling out those pre-approved credit apps. What I have noticed is that electronic crime is like water. As soon as an area is patched or blocked, it moves directly to the next area where there is value. And uh, part of the reason why I'm still doing this particular job, why I love it so much, is every day I'll get a phone call that pretty much ends up with the tagline, is this a crime? <laughs> and then we have to figure out how it applies and what it works. The two big changes that I have seen are now there's been a shift from specific computer-based crimes into mobile-based crimes. Everything is based off the cell phone or the internet access that is mobile. And because of that, what we're seeing is more crimes that are targeted to the general use when someone is out at a mall, at a location, and they're hacking, picking up information, stealing data. The goal is to hide the points at which police can trace or investigate back. And picking up inf information that is generally available on a mobile site really aids to that. The other area that we've seen is a focus on the use of information so that uh, information is taken in one location, skimmed maybe in Phoenix, uh, stolen in Chicago, and then used in, in California. We are seeing that criminals have really picked up on jurisdiction and on the fact that we're still using rules from you know, the I don't know, Middle Ages, effectively, in terms of figuring out who's responsible for what. 
and they're taking advantage of how we work. Mm. I, another, another thing that we uh, find is, how many of you guys have actually Googled your name? Yeah, yeah quite a few of you. How many have actually Googled your home address? There's a picture of my wife watering our lawn when I Google my home address and go to Google Earth. So back when the stalkers and burglars used to prepare to go to your house, there was a casing period. They used to watch you for a while. They used to take, they sit back in the car, sit you know, nice and low, low profile, and uh, you know, sometimes they were seen, sometimes not. Now that preparation period is, is overlapped. It's skipped completely. Now they can go on Google Earth and get a front, frontal view of your house. Do you have a gate? Do you have a fence? Do you have a dog? Do you have a gardener? Do you have an alarm system? They can key in on that, so now they become more effective in intruding into your personal life and your personal space. If there's no car, I, some, some of these pictures are older. Some of the Google Earth pictures are older, but still pretty consistent. Google your address today. Go home, Google it, and see how current that picture of your front house is. It may be a slightly different color, but I guarantee you that that, that fence might not be there or or the, that uh, you know, picture of the, uh, the, the fountain in the front yard might still be there. It might be current. So it's kind of scary now how that step has been now literally skipped by some of the criminals. Um, I, I do the same thing. I Google my name. I Google my children's names. And if you haven't done that, do so. If you haven't heard of Google Alerts, utilize that tool and put your children's and your family's names in there. And so if anything pops up on the Internet, uh, related to their names or whatever it is that you the criteria you enter there, uh, you'll get an email uh, alert indicating, and then you can go directly to whatever that link is. Uh, it's a good tool. I use it. I use it to. Uh, well, I've used it to search for uh, criminals, um, and a lot of my colleagues do that as well too, uh, to see what they're doing online. Um, other things that. Uh, well, I, I have a list of things here that what the criminals are doing, what the trends are with respect to the internet, and mobile, uh, mobile internet, and surveillance is one of them. Uh, you no longer have to drive out there in front of a house and case case your your uh, your victims uh, they utilize the social networking sites too as a surveillance platform they also do well a, mo a month a month ago uh, we received a report um, of a uh, uh, what we call a 528.5 where somebody created a, a, a fictitious Facebook uh, social networking site in another person's name. The 12-year-old minor uh, who was the victim has had no idea. Um, and to this date, we're not sure what the motivation was on, on the perpetrator um, who was doing this from another county. Um, but, but they're doing these sort of things. And I suspect that he was probably doing this to lure friends and family members of that minor. Um, they, they utilize the internet for fraud, for phishing, to exploit children, um, um, also to do some homework for unlawful intrusions, uh, hacking as we've been calling it. Um, copyright infringement, uh, it's a big one. Music, you know, it's, it's unfortunately a lot of our, our children are, are, are very much aware of, of how easy it is to uh, go online and pull down music. Um, and it is so simple to do, but it doesn't make it right. Um, uh, we talked about bullying, stalking. Bullying can evolve into stalking. Um, so, all of all of the crimes that we that we w normally investigated, you know, 10, 15 years ago, or have evolved with with a cyber nexus to it now. Um, and 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 as a result, um, the California Penal Code system is ever evolving, and it goes back to your last question: Is how do we keep up with that? You know, it is so rapidly evolving. Um, I don't know, Jonathan. Do you have anything else to add? No, it, um, the biggest thing that, that I am seeing is that any type of crime that currently exists can, with so, with some very few exceptions, become a digital crime. Uh, it's still it's still the same crimes. It's still theft. It's still vandalism. It's still extortion, conspiracy. It just has a new venue. And the biggest issues that we are seeing is whether or not our laws, our ability to access information, has kept up with that to be able to reflect the new types of crimes. Uh, we've been noticing that in Sacramento as well. <laughs> so if you have any thoughts, please share them with us. Um, are there any particular criminal trends when it comes to social networking websites that you see that you could share with us? The, as it relates to children, the biggest trend that, that we're seeing is, I think I heard it earlier, sextortion. 
Uh, we were re recently finished a case involving 20 victims at a local high school. Our suspect turned out to be 16 years of age. Uh, he was getting on Facebook and basically pretending to be, uh, our victims were all female. He was claiming to be their friends uh, and convincing them to send uh, uh, nude photos of themselves to, to who they thought were their friends. Uh, the case was presented over to the district attorney's office and we're pursuing cases like these as extortion. And I'll let Jonathan talk about extortion and sextortion, uh, but that's new with the DAs that we're dealing with as well here in L.A. County. Oh, wow. Countywide, one of the things that we're seeing now, uh, and unfortunately we're, we're, we're behind the eight ball on, on teaching the rest of law enforcement, and that is uh, what happens when somebody creates a fictitious uh, a Facebook account or a fictitious you know, Craigslist uh, ad in another person's name, and it's happening more and more. Um, um, unfortunately, uh, th this year alone, I think we've, uh, we've recorded 22 instances. Three of those cases involve minors. Um, and I know it's a, it's a relatively new statute. Um, and as law enforcement becomes more and more aware of it and, and, and how it is applied, I think the numbers will, will, will start to show that it's probably happening more than, than it's been reported. Do, would you say that uh, with regard to children that m most of the uh, activities uh, are, to, are dealing with teenagers or do we see younger and younger children? We all know it is against the law for children under 13 to have a social network uh, site, but unfortunately we know that it's not the case that, they, that they're staying off the internet. But maybe you could tell us some trans, are we, is, is this a problem with teenagers? Are there younger and longer, younger children? What sort of risks should we be aware of? What sort of cases are you working that you can share with us with regard to children? Well, uh, first, obviously, with regards to any juvenile case, we have to be very, very circumspect. There's an absolute protection of privacy with regards to it. So we have to talk generically. Sorry, we can't go into particular de de details. Oh, no, no, of course. Yes. Uh, but also trying to explain why we, we might be a little vague with regards yes. to details rather than giving some specifics. Mm -hmm. uh, we have, uh, our, our division has started to prosecute uh, juveniles for violations of Penal Code Section 528.5 uh, and I I identity theft involving the use of both Facebook and, and MySpace. Uh, we're only getting started with that to try and get a sense of how these cases work and there's uh, p going to be a lot more work done in the juvenile offices themselves. So uh, I can only speak to the few cases that I myself have dealt with. I, I can't tell you if these are a trend or if these are just kind of the, the luck of the draw. But uh, the minors involved in this have been in elementary school or in middle school uh, with regards to most of the behavior. So it is not just limited to uh, what we would normally think of as, as a teenager, 16, 17. It can go even as, as young as 12 or 13. <clears throat> One thing I, I have noticed is uh, dealing with some celebrity cases, you have uh, obviously younger celebrities, younger singers that come out, and with mainly the teenage crowd, crowd which obviously uh, companies like Disney and other companies like uh, sports companies target the teenage uh, spectrum of children. W what you have is these children uh, creating fake uh, Tumblr, Twitter, Facebook accounts to be target specific. A uh, perfect example is a case we just handled where a young woman, uh, I shouldn't say young woman, I didn't know it at the time, but a uh, victim received, uh, she was an ex-girlfriend of a pop singer, received a uh, threat via a Tumblr account. Tumblr is kind of like Facebook, social media. Well, the threat was very graphic, specific. It said that uh, she was going to be skinned alive, she was going to be killed in her sleep, and she knew they described details about her house, her residence, her comings and goings, you know, Google, of course. Uh, after we wrote a warrant to the Tumblr uh, people, we discovered that it was uh, the actual account that created the Tumblr account came back to uh, something sparkled, so something or other. It was a teenage girl who was upset that the pop singer had obtained this girlfriend who now was angry at the, the, pop, the, the girlfriend, so she targeted her, it targeted her specifically, graphically. So we find that more and more that socially, depending on what the popular trend is with some of these people and some of their actions, 
the teenage group is more likely to act because that anonymity behind that keyboard, they become brave. They think we're not gonna catch them. Fortunately, we had a bit of luck. Um, the other thing that we find is that some of the internet companies that might not be on United States shores, we find it very, very difficult to obtain information from them because they're in Germany, they're in Europe, they're in Paris. What kind of legal binding do we have to get them to cooperate? They laugh us off. So it's very difficult to get uh, a speedy res resolution to the case. We just had a suspect out of Israel that we're in the process of extraditing back to the United States involving a Facebook case. Uh, it's still in the works, but uh, there's probably over 80 victims throughout the United States. So within the Sheriff's Department, we're part of a lot of task forces, the Internet Crimes Against Children Task Force, the, the FBI SAFE team. And the reason behind that is, I think somebody mentioned earlier, is uh, a lot of our suspects are out of this county. They're out of the state. They're out of this country. They're all over the world. So we, we need the, the collaboration with the FBI to help us look for these people throughout the world. What type of crime was that? It was a sextortion case. Wow. And are you seeing more and more? I, I, what I'm really concerned about is young children who really don't understand um, you know, the this, this safety threat in being on the Internet. Do you see any additional threat uh, or any increased threat increasing threats for children that are, you know, 13 and younger, children that are probably not supposed to be on the internet in the first place, do you see? Is that a growing trend or? Not, not, not uh, particularly where, where the younger generation is not apt. It's more the, uh, you know, the teeny bop type thing now that they have a love obsession with the uh, star. Not necessarily with the younger crew. We don't see that in our unit anyway as a growing trend. It's more of the mid-teenage, 14, 15, and 16, where you develop crushes on people. And, of course, with social media now, you have one uh, person who hits YouTube, and now he's you know part of uh, Disney's big uh, theme stars, and it's so easy to get information about them. So in, uh, go ahead if you have a comment, and then we're going to close with one last question. What, what, what would you um, like to add? I think one thing that I, I would really like to also point out is that the kids who are 12, 13, 14, uh, the behavior tends to be against each other because uh, it's the stranger danger issue is much less than a concern about someone who doesn't like you in, in the school because they have the technical capability uh, and, but, and they lack the, the judgment. But I do have one kind of point that I would like to bring out they're aware of what they're doing. They are fully aware of what the rules are, how to set the privacy settings, how to control it. It's, it's not so much a uh, issue of them understanding the technology or the risks. It's that they lack the wisdom and judgment to understand either the effect of their activities or the empathy in some cases, or in other cases, it's a defense mechanism. Uh, if I am the cyber bully, I don't get physically bullied. And part of the problem is, is that uh, we as uh, older generations don't tend to get the check that goes on in the younger generation and, and, and privacy. If you are a 14-year-old, a, a all of your friends are in some way connected on, online. So if you say something or exaggerate something or talk about something, you're going to get called out online. So in a sense, that online community is a little bit self-verifying as well as self-regulating. And uh, it's when, so part of our focus has always been to look at the individual when the identity theft occurs, when someone's identity is taken over, when it is created. Because at that point, that, that verification breaks down, the ability of other people to comment or deal with the issue breaks down, and it allows someone easy access to a trusted source that can be targeted back to the individual. So I think we also need to, to look at this not so much as kids that they don't know what's going on. It's that there are other factors involved in triggering them to engage in uh, what in some cases can be criminal behavior. Right. That's a scary thought. Well, in closing, uh, the last question, knowing what you know because of the sort of cases you've been working on, what sort of advice would you give to parents and children? Well, <coughs> um, I, I'm first going to start off with what I do at home. Um, first of all, my 11-year-old begs me uh, at least once a week for his Facebook account, and he's not yet reached 
that level. He's not allowed. <coughs> my 16-year-old um, does have a Facebook account. And the warning that I give to my 16-year-old is that uh, beware um, and I want to have access to it. Um, so as long as dad, mom and dad have access to it and know what's occurring, um, I think that kind of gives him a little peace of mind, but it also lets him understand that, that there is overwatch. And it doesn't matter whether you're 16 um, or 17. Um, we, we as parents have a great responsibility. We as law enforcement, we as educators, we as government have responsibility to, to our children. And we have to ex explain to them, if it isn't one-on-one -on -one in an open forum, of what, what the problems are, what the, prob what the uh, threats are um, uh, with exposing too much of yourself on the internet. Um, with respect to, uh, to at least what I do on my side of the shop, you don't venture out into the internet without protection. You don't venture out in the internet without um, antivirus. You don't venture out in the internet without anti-spam. You don't venture out in the internet without knowing much about the internet. We don't walk down into a dark alley in a, in a crime-infested neighborhood uh, in the middle of the night. You don't do that in the internet either. Um, and that's one of the things that, that, that I try to tell people is that just because you have a computer, um, um, that you don't venture out without knowing what this stuff is all about. And you don't venture out there without protecting yourself and ensuring that you have safeguards, not only uh, safeguards by, by not putting out too much information about yourself, but also something to protect your computer, something to protect you from, from viruses and hackers, which are prolific. They're out there. Um, those are some of the, some of the most common uh, bits of, of uh, advice that I give. Probably on a daily basis, I get phone calls every day about that sort of thing, especially because of what we do in, ours, in our side of the shop. Thank you very much. Any other advice? Following back on what Rolando just said, I do a lot of presentations, again, to PTA groups, to kids. Uh, the number one response I get from parents is, I don't know anything about Facebook. I don't know anything about computers. And my response is typically, please learn, okay? Sit there with your child, learn their passwords, ask them what they're doing on the internet. Because if you don't, somebody else will. Okay, somebody else is gonna talk to them on the internet, and it might be that predator that's out there. Thank you. I think, <clears throat> back then, if we go back 20, 30 years, uh, if you see some of the old television shows, Leave it to Beaver, so on and so forth, uh, the biggest concern is, do you have a hat on? It's cold outside. Uh, you have a dollar to buy some food or some milk for cookies, yeah. Nowadays, I think it's the parent's responsibility to be more vigilant, and like it's been said, learn more about this. It's not gonna go anywhere, it's gonna grow. And it's growing at a rate we're not able to control. Law enforcement can't control it, educators can't control it, the public can't control it. So I believe, and in, in my strong opinion, I think that some of these websites that afford us this access should be more responsible in providing some type of public service announcement and making sure that before you click that agree and read that uh, agreement uh, affidavit that nobody really reads, you just click agree and it's gone. They should, they should be forced to watch a video. Something that makes them more responsible. Uh, we know that the parents probably will never watch it. It's, it's that teenager that needs to know the repercussions of putting too much information out, that giving their personal information to somebody that shouldn't have it, or a picture, what the repercussions of it are. And maybe law enforcement should start a small uh, education when they meet people, such as PTA groups and forums like this, is great. Let's make the websites responsible, just like we held the cigarettes companies responsible for all the damage they've caused throughout th this. It's put back on the public. Uh, now you know the dangers. What are you going to do about it now? The websites also have a responsibility to keep us safe. They're making millions of dollars on their behalf. Invest that back into the community and into the forums. Thank you very much. Very well said. Yes. You know, uh, uh, I have to say that while I, I certainly respect that idea, that, that's one area where I absolutely disagree because uh, I've had cases where we've had, uh, where we've, n n we've notified 300,000 people of potential data breaches. and six people bother to respond. I think we have too many notices. 
I think we have so many going off in so many different ways. We tune them out, like those data breach notices we all get for every time someone's accessed our card, et cetera. Anyone do anything with those? Anyone follow them up? No, they become like cry wolf. My approach that I have seen to work effectively is education coupled with targeted at the right point in time. Uh, my son recently, as part of his ethics classes and his civics classes in fifth grade, the first thing that was done was cyberbullying, cyber etiquette, and how to approach and deal with others. The educational component at the school that is not only brought into the students as well as brought into the, the parents by focusing on not just rights but responsibilities. Guess what? As a parent, if you don't watch what your kid does online, you're liable. Whether you knew or not, whether you bothered to read the manual, whether you bothered to understand the technology or not, you can't just hand a 16-year-old keys to the car and say, son, go have fun, figure it out. You have to know. So it is the parent's responsibility. I, I don't believe it's the website's responsibility. I think that they can certainly be helpful. I think they can certainly assist in the information package. But ultimately, it, it comes down to personal responsibility as well as a targeted education and approach to make sure that kids understand. And one of the things that I loved about the last panel was n not only all the things that are bad about the internet, but what the wonderful capabilities are and how this wonderful gift can benefit you or it can really put you in, in trouble, your call. Thank you very much. Yes, please. We can agree to disagree uh, that the websites do not have a liability or responsibility to be the advocates to their own uh, demise. But if you do have a problem, and uh, the Twitter stage, the Facebook stage, they will acknowledge responsibility for somebody acting irresponsibly on their website. Uh, you can contact Facebook and Twitter and say, hey, you know what, the guy bearing this handle or this URL is doing X, Y, B, and Z C type of activity. They will send them a message saying, hey, behave. That's how they recognize the liability because they want to stop it. Lawsuits are rampant in the Internet uh, age. They, they, the last thing they want is another lawsuit across their desk. So they are uh, accepting some responsibility in stopping that behavior. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, are there any questions for this panel from the audience? Please come forward. There's a microphone right over here to your right. We have time for maybe one or two questions. Are there any other questions for this panel? Thank you. Um, Please. Okay. Uh, my question is, I am especially interested in issues regarding human trafficking. So I would like to know if you have identified any type, any criminals or traffickers that have used um, online access to promote the crime? There's uh, numerous organizations here in Los Angeles County. We have ICANN that has a subgroup that's specifically dealing with the issue of human trafficking here in Los Angeles County. There's various throughout the state of California. If you need, I'll give you my business card afterwards and I can give you the information. Uh, I belong to a few of them myself on human trafficking involving kids. Thank you very much for the question. We have uh, one more question. First of all, thank you very much for uh, this great panel. Uh, really appreciate it. Um, when it comes to, oh, and the cyber tip line, cyber tip crime line for FBI, yeah. The um, information, sharing of information, schools are confused uh, about where policy of the school, and hey, Johnny, uh, I don't know why you pick on Johnny. Johnny, um, now tell us if you did it. Do the right thing. And then Johnny tells the right thing and we have school discipline. But when a law enforcement officer is in the room, Johnny tells and the Miranda rights aren't read. I mean, just this summer, that was a Supreme Court reversal of lower courts. And the reason I bring that up is the question is, it's confusing for sc school staff where the legal lines are. It is also confusing for law enforcement. We had a, a uh, assistant principal four years ago who picked up a phone with child uh, uh, sexting on it, reported it to the police, um, told the parents, and the, the assistant principal was arrested because he was in possession of child porn. And he was trying to take care of the kid. So the question is, what are we doing 
from law enforcement to the school to make sure that we're not blurring those lines and we have some sort of competence of how to proceed without, you know, having a come back in our face. I guess it's law enforcement education to, to the schools. Does you want to answer? Oh, uh, that's a, an excellent question. Uh, it's also an area where I, I think that the legislature can have a meaningful Im impact. Uh, I think one of the first areas that we need to decide is the jurisdiction of a school for activities that are directed against students in the school, but also let's not forget another category who gets bullied, teachers. When there is an assault on, on a teacher, when there is an attack on a teacher's reputation, at what point does the school have some level of responsibility or jurisdiction? And those are going to be, I think, two separate approaches. The second area is to talk about what, and this is a, the hardest line to cross, what crosses from being a uh, appropriate school-based disciplinary action into something that results in a crime. Well there, uh, I think what we look at is we already have 528.5 and we have the identity theft statute. So clearly when you have the taking over of an identity, you've got a clear criminal act. But what, but what about when the bullying or the harassment is done in the person's own name? Well then I think we start running into First Amendment issues. And those issues can provide a pretty good guidepost for us as to when it's appropriate to deal with at the school level and when it might be criminal. Uh, I, I, uh, I, I hesitate to provide clear guidelines because I think that you're going to need to, we're going to need to resolve this issue with some cases over a period of time. But I also think that the courts are pretty aware of that. There was a recent case involving a uh, potential terrorist threat at a school. I went all the way up to the California Supreme Court and they ultimately concluded that it wasn't a terrorist threat. They then spent the rest of the opinion telling the school and the police they did exactly the right thing. They investigated it, they checked in it. It was far better for them to be wrong about what was a terrorist threat than to potentially have the harm or some of the issues coming about. Uh, there isn't a, a, a bright line rule, but I do think this is an area where in the education code with a clear definition of responsibilities for the school can really clarify this particular issue. Thank you very much. Um, I would also encourage all of you, if you do have any thoughts, uh, ideas uh, for things that we should be looking at legislatively with regard to this subject, um, I would be very, very interested in continuing that discussion. So thank you very much for spending your time with us today. Let's thank the panelists of this very important panel. Thank you very much. Our next panel is starting in about two minutes, so if you could please come on forward. Thank you very much.